All right, so we're going to move along, and now we're going to look at um, some neurobiology. But this time we're going to actually now include some of the hormonal stuff. So let's talk about neurohormones or just hormones in general. And the word means to travel. So what it means is you have some endocrine gland uh, that is producing a hormone of some sort. And then that is going to be sent through the bloodstream, typically, um, to another area, uh, some kind of target cell where it will actually work. And so what I want you to know is there's really two types. There are protein or peptide hormones. A peptide hormone is just a small protein. Um, they can be stored and they don't require carrier chemicals. So they can just float in the bloodstream, no problem. Uh, acetylcholine was one of, uh, was one of those. Um, growth hormone is another. Uh, so our body has lots of different ones. And then there's also steroid hormones. And these are a uh, little slower in their use. Um, they can't be stored, so they're released directly into the bloodstream. And then uh, they may take a while to work. And they usually not always, but most of them need something to attach to as they go through the blood. Um, estrogen and testosterone are examples of steroid hormones. And so just to kind of give you an idea of how it physically works. Okay, so what we want you to know is, is more in kind of a general idea is hormone systems uh, release, they have an input. So there's some environmental stimulus that um, releases one of the hormones. It then kind of goes through the nervous system, processes what's going on, what are we gonna do with this? And then there is some output or effect. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, move this muscle. We're going to get this gland to secrete something. We're gonna get this organ to do something. Um, and then uh, basically we see a behavior on the end of this. Uh, so for instance, on the bottom here, uh, you know, it can trigger a behavior. It can modify a behavior that's already happening, increase it or decrease it, or it can even prime the behavior, make, make, make you more likely to do something. And so we have an example on the bottom over here of testosterone. Testosterone levels uh, increase when males fight. And what happens then is as they fight, um, the testosterone level will, will go up. And then winning the fight actually causes more testosterone. That win jacks you up, uh, which might prime you for another fight. And uh, so it increases the circulation, uh, circulation of testosterone in the body. Okay. And just to give you uh, uh, effects of long term, uh, there's a study done on mice, white mice, white rats, I guess, um, white mice, they're mice, um, on pregnancy. And we really don't think about this. Uh, but males, you know, they were looked at embryos and, and obviously mice have lots of babies. So they found out that males that were surrounded by two other male embryos were affected. Uh, by um, higher levels of testosterone. What makes men men is testosterone. And it turns out what makes women women is not um, estrogen. It is actually the lack of testosterone or the low levels. Uh, females do have testosterone. Um, so it, it, it's interesting that then that uh, if I'm a male embryo and I have two surrounding me, there's higher levels of testosterone. And what they found out when they come out, these what they call these 2M uh, males, they're more aggressive um, and they, they mark their territories more and they, they have more copulations with females. Um, and then ones that are surrounded by two females, uh, they're not being exposed to um, that testosterone. And... Uh, um, then you see it uh, last. And we're gonna talk about this behavior sometime, uh, when we talk about communication and hyenas, uh, it actually also occurs. So we'll, we'll talk about these things. All right, and so what we wanna do with this study is work at, look at honeybees. And it turns out, you know, they're all kind of related. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of that with genetics, uh, but the bees have duties. And when they first come out, they clean the cell, uh, pretty easy job center of the hive, and then they start feeding the larvae or their nest mates. That's kind of the job number two. Uh, the drones, the males, and then uh, they become this utility worker, packing pollen, fixing the hive, uh, things like that. And then the last thing they do is actually foraging. So their life cycle goes through and you can see how many days, you know, bees don't last that long, uh, but you can see, you know, within the, the 25 days, 
uh, uh, you know, what they're most likely to do and then their job kind of changes as they go. Yeah, and there's a video on this actually. So the number of forgers do not seem to significantly change. They did a study and found out uh, the number of foragers and you got the young resident bees versus the added bees. So if you add a bunch of uh, uh, bees to it, the younger bees um, stay younger. You know, they just, they don't go forage. Uh, but then what happens if you take out all the older bees that are foraging, there's a signal that goes out and it's basically, hey, we need food. And so the younger bees then will leave earlier and they start to change. So we're going to look at the change, and it turns out it is the juvenile hormone 3, JH3. Uh, and it's produced in a structure called the corpus allotum. And you can see it right here kind of in the face area. And um, what they did is they removed that. And uh, it is this hormone that really kind of gears these organisms um, to go out and forage. Um, and without it, uh, they, they don't really get that signal. Um, and so uh, the, other, the other hormone I want you to know that's um, responsible is octopamine, also increases foraging behavior. Uh, it allows them to learn. It turns out foraging is dangerous and you have to learn a lot about spatial, where am I? Um, they do these orientation flights. Um, it helps their visual uh, olfactory, Castoria, uh, which is basically taste. Uh, so all of these things, they gotta know what food is. They gotta be able to go find it. Um, they gotta be able to smell it, recognize it. Uh, and um, they, uh, to do the long flights, it's heavier, heavier demand. So all of these things are then caused by an increase in these two hormones. So I want you to know these hormones. Um, and, and if you notice here, fight or flight, we talked about that with us, uh, same very, very soon. So, um, they think this is a stress hormone, um, um, and uh, noradrenaline, which is one of our neurotransmitters, uh, they believe this is a stress hormone. So you see it higher, um, it stimulates sugar production again to, um, to fuel that flight. All right, uh, there's also some structural uh, orientations and the mushroom bodies, and it's funny, this picture says it's in, the, <laughs> in light blue, but it's actually the reddish stuff up here. Um, and so it's kind of a misprint on this book, but um, foraging bees and uh, foraging behavior, the, the mushroom bodies also get larger. Um, uh, what happens with bees before they actually go forage, they do what they call these orientation flights where they'll just kind of hover and fly around. And what they're trying, what they're doing, I think is, uh, well, we think uh, is trying to figure out where, where are we, you know, where, where is, it's kind of like learning your neighborhood. Um, okay, so if I'm going to fly out, and what they find out is foraging bees have a uh, mushroom body that's 14.8% larger, so it increases the size. So there's a physical, structural uh, part of the nervous system that, that increases. Um, and uh, so, so what you see is, uh, is the size uh, increases in these things as, um, as they become foragers. Now what they did is a foraging behavior where uh, they remove the old foragers and bees develop into foragers sooner. So the younger bees, the hormones kick in and then these mushroom bodies start to expand and they get bigger. Um, so again, uh, you know, if you ask for the proximate factor, it is the mushroom bodies, it is the uh, juvenile homeland three, and it is the, and I can't pronounce it quite right, the, uh, um, octopamine, I think. Um, so those three things are um, responsible um, for foraging. So we have a neurology with the, with the thing. We have hormones with the two hormones. Um, but then the, again, the ultimate cause is we need food. We, we have to figure out how to get food. And we'll talk about communication of bee flight when we do communication. And so we will stop the share and stop the recording.